Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Lownan, and this is um, the second in a set of video lectures introducing the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So uh, just to remind you of where we let off in the first lecture, we defined micro and macro evolution, and we're focusing on microevolution, which can be defined as a change in allele frequency within a population over generations. And we looked at the terms allele frequency in the previous lecture, and you did some scoring, and uh, we talked about how if you can do that over generations, you can then calculate allele frequencies, and you can compare them over generations. And you can say, well, okay, the frequency of the big A, maybe it was 14 over 20 in generation 1, and in generation 2, it was 18 over 20. And there was a corresponding change in the frequency of the recessive allele from 6 over 20 to 2 over 20. And that change suggests that evolution has happened. And that's great. It's not that hard to do that with a relatively simple set of data where you can look at and score every organism. But what do you do when it's a big population and you can only sample from within that big population? How do you like relatively easily calculate things like genotype frequency from a set of data or a smaller limited set of information? Can you look at a data set from one or two measures like perhaps phenotype frequency and knowledge of the genes, derive allele frequency, and um, can you then make predictions about numbers of individuals that might have a particular genotype and therefore a phenotype? So this is where we segue into a little history. So in the early 1900s, Hardy and Weinberg, sorry, not Beg, Weinberg, were working separately <clears throat> but they were working on the same ideas. <clears throat> they both were really interested in analyzing allele frequencies in populations using something that was not a Punnett square approach, but that did rely on Mendelian genetics. So at that time in history, people were really interested in the work of Mendel, which had been recently rediscovered because it had been lost for a while and it was rediscovered at that time. Um, and they were also really interested in the ideas of Darwin and Wallace, who proposed evolution through um, the mechanism of natural selection. And what Hardy and Weinberg, working separately, wanted to do was they wanted to take the ideas of Darwin and Wallace and unite them with the ideas of Mendel, and uniting patterns of inheritance with evolution. They wanted to be, to be able to see if you could test for change or for no change in allele frequencies over generations? Could you test for evolution? They were also interested in questioning a couple of the assumptions that people had at that time, and I haven't written them on the slide here, but just listen carefully. One of those assumptions was that if there are two alleles for a given gene in a population, the dominant allele will always take over. And that's, that's like a myth, that's just not the case, okay? Um, and we know that now, but people were arguing that that would be the case back in the early 1900s. Um, so they were, they were interested in being able to actually systematically measure allele frequency and show that uh, wouldn't be the case. Um, they were also interested in showing that if you had two alleles for a given gene like big A and little a, they wouldn't always be in populations as half and half, like 0.5 frequency and 0.5 frequency, which um, some people were arguing would likely be the case. So they came up with this model, and it's um, it gets called now the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So both of them have their names in there of honor of the work that they did. And um, it's a model that proposes that if the allele frequency in a population does not change over time, then that population is in something called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And, it, and this can only happen if the population is not evolving. So it's, it's kind of a weird non-intuitive model in some ways, but it's a model that lets us study evolution by assuming that evolution is not happening. Um, and once you can get your head around that and just be comfortable with that weirdness, you will be better able to understand the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There are some assumptions underlying the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The assumption that the population is, is gigantic, it is infinitely large, that each member of the population is equally likely to mate and to produce viable, and I should have said infertile, offspring. That mating is entirely random 
and that there is no evolution happening. So in other words, there is no natural selection, there is no mutation, there is no migration or gene drift. And a couple of those words we haven't really introduced here yet, but just remember that evolution is genetic change over time. And so there is no genetic change over time due to any sort of evolutionary force or mechanism. And the mechanisms of evolution you know, are listed here. If all of these assumptions are met, then allele frequency in a population will not change over, ge over successive generations, and we can say that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. You should already be scratching your head and saying like, hmm, this seems like made up hokey stuff because like, of course I know that mating is not entirely random because I would most certainly hope that you are not mating entirely randomly, that in fact we select our mates very carefully. Um, Populations are always not infinitely large. They can sometimes be small, like an island population. Um, also, each member of a population is not going to be equally likely to mate and produce viable offspring as another because there'll be some variation in that. Variation is part of natural populations. Also, mutation happens all the time. So, of course, there has to be you know, some sort of genetic change over time. But nonetheless, these are the assumptions, and they give us in collective... They give us a way to look at a, at a population as a system and, and know what would we see if evolution wasn't happening. It's something called a null model. There's an idea here that I want to just remind you of because you've just come out of spending some time in Mendelian genetics. And as I've said earlier, in Mendelian genetics, we're interested in alleles and we're interested in how they get passed on to offspring, but we just focus in like, one parent and one set of offspring at a time and track that very precisely. In population genetics, we look at all the individuals in the population and we look at all of their gametes as if they had been thrown out there into one big bucket. And we look at that. And within that pool of gametes, we look for the alleles that are present and we count up their frequencies. And that's kind of what what you get if you have totally random matings is a big bucket of gametes that could unite with one another in a totally random way. It's a model. So that in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, Hardy and Weinberg actually came up with those ideas, but they didn't, they didn't actually like make these equations. Um, those were done you know, by people who were trying to apply their ideas after the fact. And the key one here is this which I've actually already introduced to you in the previous slide. You just might not have looked at it enough yet. So P is the term that is used to refer to the frequency of the dominant allele. For example, big A in the big A little a system. Q is the term used to, to describe the frequency of the recessive allele. For example, little a. And if you're looking at a population, if you add up the frequency of big A, plus the frequency of little a, you've got to get to one because the only two possible alleles are big A and little a. So P plus Q equals one is, is part of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It is in fact the Hardy-Weinberg equation. If we're looking at allele frequencies, if you know P, you can calculate Q. So if P is 0.5, Q's got to be 0.5. If P is 0.8, Q has got to be 0.2 and so on. Okay, very simple. All right, what about taking this up to genotypes? Well, <coughs> in genotypes of eukaryotic organisms, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to have two alleles, right, for each individual. So that means you're going to want to take that P plus Q equation and say that, all right, the chance of having genotype, uh, you know, any given genotype can be calculated using this equation and in fact if you take p plus q and you multiply it by p plus q and you work that through algebraically you get this equation down here p squared plus 2pq plus q squared and it still equals one except for now we have terms that let us estimate or calculate genotype frequencies such that the term p squared is the frequency of individuals in a population with genotype big A, big A. So if the frequency of P is 
then the frequency of the genotype big A, big A is going to be 0.5 times 0.5, which is going to be 0 0.25. It'll be a quarter of the population. The term 2PQ is the frequency of the heterozygote, and the term Q squared is the frequency of the homozygous recessive individual. These are things you just have to remember, okay, even though you could actually derive this stuff, but for now I want you to remember it. Let's look at an example problem using this information. So let's say you have a population of 100 mice. And it's the same mice we were looking at in the previous slide. So big A is associated with brown coat color and it's, it color and it's dominant. Little a is the recessive allele associated with black coat color. All right. So the frequency of the big A allele, let's just say it's 30%. Okay. So what are P and Q? Well, 30% is P, okay? It's the, the frequency of the dominant allele. So here it's 30%, or expressed as a reduced number, it's 0 0.3, right? If you know that, and you know that P plus Q equals 1, then Q has to equal 1 minus 0.3 equals 0 0.7. How do I know that I've done my math right? 0 0.3 plus 0 0.7 together make 1. Here's another example problem. Let's say that you're looking at a population of mice like the one we looked at earlier, and you're saying that P is 0.3 and Q is 0.7, as we just said a moment ago. What's the frequency of heterozygotes, big A, little a, in that population? Okay. So from the, this equation, that's the equation that I use. If I want to know allele frequencies, I'm interested in P plus Q equals 1. If I want to know genotype frequencies and a heterozygote is a genotype, I'm going to use p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, okay? And the frequency of heterozygotes is always this 2pq term. So here I know that I know p and I know q, and it's easy for me to solve this. So the frequency of heterozygotes is 2 times p times 0.7, and I did that math earlier, and it gets me 0 0.42. In other words, 42% of that population, if the population is at Harder-Weinberg equilibrium, is heterozygous for this gene. This one looks really texty, okay? But it just builds a little bit on the previous ones, right? So let's say you've got another different population, but same, you know, same kind of mice. We've got 100 of those mice, right? And they have the same kind of genes that control their coat color. Right, where little a, little a is the gray coat color. And as long as you have the dominant big A allele, you have the brown coat color. Let's say 20 of them have black fur. We can't, do, we can't afford to do the molecular biology, but we can look at them and we can see that they have, uh, I should have said gray here because I'm changing my description here on you midway through. They have gray, gray fur. So then we say, what's the allele frequency for a, big A and little a? What's the frequency of gen this genotype, or this genotype, or big A, little a genotype? We could ask all those questions from this information. So we know that the gray mice have genotype little a, little a, because we talked about that earlier, okay? Let's say that the genotype frequency for little a, little a is the term Q squared, which we know because that's the term for it in the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Just to go back there for a minute, right? Here's the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium equation, and this term relates to the frequency of little a, little a genotype in a population within equilibrium. So back to here, our gray mice have this genotype. The genotype frequency is the term Q squared, and Q squared is 20 out of 100. Where did I get that? From the information in this word problem equals 0 0.2. So Q, if Q squared equals 0 0.2, then Q must equal the square root of 0 0.2, and that is 0 0.447 and some change. Okay, I looked that up. So um, since that gives me Q, right? So if I've got Q, <coughs> I know this frequency of A. Do I get the frequency of big A? Well, I use the allele frequency equation. P plus Q equals 1. 
p equals 1 minus q equals 1 minus 0 0.447 equals 0 0.553. I'm rounding just a little bit in this. So I can immediately solve for the terms uh, q and then apply that to get the term p. All right, what about the next part? What are the genotype frequencies for the three possible genotypes that could exist in this population? All right, well, I mean, right away I know the genotype frequency actually of little a, little a, it's 20 out of 100 mice or 0.2. So I've got this way to like check my math here. But I'm going to pretend I don't. I'm just going to use the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and I'm going to start with the frequency of big A, big A instead. Big A, big A is the term P squared according to the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Well, P squared is this times this, P times P. I had just calculated P up here, and that gives me 0 0.306. The little a, little a is the term Q squared, and Q is 0 0.447. 0 0.447 times itself gives me 0 0.2, and I can double check that with my numbers up here, and I'm good to go so far. What about the heterozygotes? What's the frequency of that genotype in this population? It can be calculated using the term 2pq, which is 2 times p times q, and it gives me 0 0.494. How do, know, how do I know I haven't just like screwed something up here? If I sum these three, I should get to the number 1. Be careful with rounding in this, right? Um, but when I sum them, I get back to the number 1, which supports my math so far. Everybody good with that? Um, so remember too, like you could also have added in like, well, how many, how many actual mice are there with this genotype? You know, and if I wanted to know that, I'd take the frequency of that genotype and I'd multiply it by the number of mice in the population, which is 100, and that's where I would get 49.4 mice. And I mean, that should trouble you a little bit because how do you get like 0 0.4 of a mouse? And remember, these are decimal mice. It's possible, theoretically. So it's in, in predicted or expected data, it's possible to have decimal organisms. So you can do handy calculations like this to answer genetic population problems. Um, but Hardy and Weinberg conceived of all of this so they could compare allele frequencies across generations and thus test for evolution. We haven't really done that yet, right? So, for example, this problem that we looked at earlier, right? Um, if we were to apply the Hardy Weinberg within each of these um, populations, if they had been much bigger and it was harder to actually figure out those allele frequencies, then we could look at them and we could compare them over time. And if we were trying to figure out allele frequencies for, you know, really big populations based on a smaller amount of data, then we could, we could do that using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This would be a population not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because the allele frequencies are not staying, like they're not sticking over time, they're changing. Um, and also it's a pretty tiny population, only 10 mice. So I'm going to finish with that um, because I really just wanted to introduce the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and kind of the mechanics of applying it to ask some simple questions about populations. But I'm also going to warn you that um, a lot of the video content information out there is pretty confusing about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's done a little sloppily, and I, I hope this hasn't been sloppy, but, you know, maybe I did it too. And you always want to ask yourself, do those assumptions make sense, and would they apply to the question at hand? And if not, why? And that the Hardy-Weinberg is a null model, um, and that what you find in your data set will be data set specific. So with that... I'm going to close this um, small mini lecture.